I want to welcome everyone to EMS Station 10. It is a great honor to be here, truly, uh, to spend some time with these extraordinary professionals who serve us and do it with such skill and professionalism, and I dare say courage as well. On behalf of all New Yorkers, I want to thank them. I want to thank all the individuals gathered here for what they do for our city. It's been a challenging week in New York City, but New Yorkers could look with great admiration, with great pride, with great comfort, the fact that these professionals were on the job keeping us safe, something that gives people a real sense of security, knowing that the very best professionals are on the case. We certainly saw that play out last Thursday and since, uh, everything being done as well as it possibly could be done. And these are individuals who deserve our deep, deep appreciation. You know, think about that for a moment. You get a call saying there's a man who has Ebola symptoms. And folks here had to swing into action with other units from around the city. They had to respond to something previously unknown in our city. They had to rely on their training and their leadership, and they did that without question. They did it with strength, and they made the whole situation work right because they started this scenario right. They got the call. They did exactly what their training told them to do. They got the patient to Bellevue Hospital where the extraordinary professionals at Bellevue took over. I want to just give you a point of symmetry. I was at Bellevue the other day, and I think we're all tremendously proud of the men and women at Bellevue for what they are doing right now. Uh, they, as a, a group of professionals, serve in a facility uh, that has been visited by crisis and problems for decades. Wherever there's a profound health challenge in this city, it ultimately ends up being dealt with at Bellevue. And they are battle-tested. And I said the other day that the men and women at Bellevue are the equivalent in healthcare terms of the U.S. Marines. Well, I want to say about the folks who are part of FDNY HAZTAC and HAZMAT, they are the equivalent of the Navy SEALs because they go into extraordinarily tough situations with the very finest of training. And these are people who volunteer for the mission. These are people who are willing to take on a bigger challenge, and that's what makes them so great. They chose to do it. They trained carefully, meticulously, they have that camaraderie, had a, the honor of talking with a number of these individuals who were part of the operation to bring in Dr. Spencer safely. The sense of camaraderie, having each other's back, supporting each other. The team that then, the hazmat team that helped them uh, to make sure that after the operation their gear was handled properly, their clothing was handled properly. Uh, extraordinary teamwork and something all New Yorkers should be very, very proud of. Everyone knows this operation went very smoothly. It was evidence of what this city can do in an atmosphere of crisis. And then the call came again the other night with the five-year-old boy and the possibility of a second case. As you know now, a statement just went out confirming, thank God, that this young boy is Ebola-free. He has a different medical condition, respiratory condition. Uh, but. Uh, no evidence of Ebola at all, and that is a, a very good piece of news for all of us. But when uh, these teams are called, they don't get to know what's going to happen at the end of the process when the tests are taken. Uh, they have to be prepared to deal with the situation as if uh, the patient has been stricken with the disease. And they did it again brilliantly the other night with the five-year-old boy and his mother bringing them both in very, very safely. I want to tell you that this level of skill and professionalism doesn't happen by accident. It takes great leaders in the FDNY and EMS to create an atmosphere where the training is so precise, the leadership is so exceptional. I want to thank the FDNY leadership. Our court commissioner, of course, Dan Nigro, who's been leading the way throughout this effort. First Deputy Commissioner, Robert Turner. Uh, our Brooklyn Borough Commander, James Leonard, who's about to become our Chief of Department. The Chief of EMS, Abdo Namod, and I want to thank here from Station 10, Captain James, excuse me, Joseph Pataki, Captain Joseph Pataki, uh, for his leadership. 
this being one of the units that was called in in that particularly challenging moment. Again, that's the leaders. They deserve a lot of credit, but it is the everyday folks at the front line who deserve our special praise, the professionals, the EMTs, and the paramedics who do the work under the most difficult circumstances. So I want to thank all the EMTs and paramedics of EMS Station 10 in East Harlem and EMS Station 14 in Mott Haven. Uh, each of them played a key role in this operation. Each of them was ready no matter what was thrown at them. And all the members of FDNY, HAZTAC, and HAZMAT units have this training and are ready to answer the call. Particularly want to thank their leadership, Paul Miano, the EMS captain in the HAZTAC unit, and Edward Bergamini, the HAZMAT battalion chief. Also, a crucial role was played by e FDNY Engine Company 44. They're part of the decontamination unit uh, that served immediately at Bellevue to make sure their fellow first responders were safe. So this is an extraordinary team effort. A lot of support is given to the people who do this work by the leaders of their labor unions. I want to thank Izzy Miranda, president of Local 2507, and Vincent Variali, president of the EMS Officers Union, for their support. Our elected officials uh, who have been with us throughout these last days, spreading the truth, spreading facts, helping to dispel the rumors, helping to comfort people. Part of what's been amazing these last days, I just heard from uh, some of the men who were part of the uh, effort to bring Dr. Spencer in that it wasn't just them. It was other elements of FDNY helping them. It was, it was uh, NYPD helping them to secure the area around the building and escort them safely. We've had people from the health department talking to people in any building that was affected and in the immediate neighborhood, also from the mayor's office of community affairs. There's been a real team effort to spread the truth about what's going on to calm people with facts and with information. Our elected officials have been exemplary uh, in getting the word out to people in their communities, calming fears, helping people know what they can do and where they can get information. I want to thank the chair of the City Council Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice, Liz Crowley. And I want to thank New York State Senator Liz Kruger for being with us. So this is one of the ultimate moments of seeing the result of teamwork. You know, we're talking a lot in these last days about the buddy system uh, that's being used to make sure each other is safe. Uh, an age-old practice, but one that's proving to be absolutely crucial to making sure the people who serve us are kept safe. You saw that play out perfectly in these last circumstances. There's a courage running through the people who do this work. They volunteered to take on extraordinarily dangerous challenges. They do it out of their devotion to helping their fellow New Yorkers. They do it out of a sense of pride and professionalism. And they do it knowing that their colleagues have their back. And that's why it makes such a difference for all of us to have that kind of level of talent and professionalism. I want to thank them all. It's great that we don't have to go to the movies or turn on the television to see heroes. You can find them walking the streets of our city, and a number of them are around us right here today. Just want to say a few words in Spanish. Quiero agradecer a los hombres y mujeres de servicios médicos de emergencia del Departamento de Bomberos por su excelente trabajo transportando al hospital de forma segura al primer paciente de Nueva York con ébola. En momentos como este, estamos agradecidos por el profesionalismo y la valentía que estos servidores públicos muestran todos los días. With that, I'd like to welcome a great leader who has really helped the FDNY to continue its march to continue to be better all the time, something uh, that this organization is committed to, our fire commissioner, Dan Nigro. Well, first, let me thank the mayor for his support and his kind words today. I'm very proud to be fire commissioner because of the people behind me, because of our firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics. And the reason this did work so well was because the folks that make up 
our HAZTAC ambulances and HAZMAT units are highly motivated. They're highly trained. They've been training for years to be members of these units, and they've been training for months now for the possibility of transporting an Ebola patient or a possible Ebola patient. They were ready. They remain ready. We have units all over the city of highly trained people ready to take care of whatever may come their way. And they did a remarkable job, but I was not surprised, and I will not be surprised tomorrow or the next day that they continue to do that type of work because they are motivated to do it, they are trained to do it, equipped to do it, and the fire department will continue to support them and support their efforts to take care of uh, all New Yorkers if they need it. So I'm very proud to be here as Fire Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Well, we have the pleasure of being in the district of Council Speaker Melissa Mark Vivrito, and she has been an extraordinary partner uh, as we've addressed the crisis of the last few days. It reminds me in the days after another crisis and the explosion in East Harlem, how she and her team mobilized to reach out throughout the community, support people, get them the help they needed, inform them. Uh, she has really been a, a powerful, calming presence in each of these crises. I want to thank her for her partnership. Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'm proud to represent this district, and I'm proud to represent this station and all the fire personnel that are here, the emergency workers. I, I wanted to just take a moment as a New Yorker, um, outside of the hat of Speaker, to personally thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for your leadership, for your unwavering presence of firmness and commitment to making sure that we are getting accurate and precise information and being able to instill a sense of calm in this city uh, to make sure that we all go about every day our usual well, work and business. And that means a lot. I think that that's important during these moments and I want to thank, uh, obviously, Commissioner Nigro and Commissioner Bassett uh, and everyone that has helped in respond to this issue. And so that is uh, something I wanted to just say personally. It means a lot that um, you've been there for each step of the way. So I want to thank also our EMS workers, our emergency personnel. Uh, this base, after Hurricane Sandy, was offline for many, many months. And um, the personnel here each and every day work very hard to not only lend service to residents and constituents in this district, but obviously beyond. And so for those that work here at EMS stations 10, 13, and 14, we thank you. Uh, every day they work to uh, protect and serve New York City residents throughout. So our city is working really hard at all levels. Every single one, my colleagues here in government, we all play a role to address this issue um, in New York with clear protocols and obviously also with compassion for anyone who may be, who may be impacted. The FDNY is a major and valued component of that effort. Our thoughts and prayers remain with Dr. Spencer and we thank him for bravely helping and taking care of individuals abroad who may not have the same access to resources and medical care as we do here in the United States, and especially here in New York City. And obviously now it is our turn to help him. And that's exactly what the brave members of FDNY EMS stations 10, 13, and 14 did by transferring Dr. Spencer from his home to Bellevue Hospital. These EMS workers went above and beyond to make sure the patient would get the care he needed, while also observing the necessary protocols to ensure that our city was kept safe from any potential threat or exposure. Being a member of FDNY and the EMS takes commitment, compassion, and bravery. And so I wanted to definitely be here personally uh, to, be, to thank and demonstrate how proud we are to these members uh, in my district that they dutifully provide services throughout New York City. So, estamos aquí para darle las gracias a estos trabajadores de emergencia que han asistido en este caso en particular del doctor Spencer, que fue trasladado al hospital y lo han hecho de una manera sumamente profesional, manteniendo la calma y también manteniendo la seguridad de todo New York. Así que les damos las gracias y estamos bien orgullosos de ellos hoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Finally, I'd like us to hear from another elected official who's really led the way in spreading a message, again, of fact, a message of calm, a message of our ability to help people uh, in a way that's been deeply felt by the people of Brooklyn and beyond, the borough president of Brooklyn, Eric Adams. And uh, I, 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 too, want to add my voice. Uh, and I was listening to some of the uh, uh, EMT employees and talking about what they do. And it reflected on when I took hazmat training as a police officer and recalling how when you wear the hazmat suit, the challenge of doing an already difficult job and attempting to do it while you're fully covered is, is really challenging. And these men and women who volunteer uh, to carry out uh, this uh, form of job is remarkable. And uh, the mayor alluded several times to the term team. And I always use that metaphor when we talk about the different components and what he has done over the last few days when I was with him at Bellevue Hospital and now here today is to really show New Yorkers uh, all of the different um, players on the team and who really uh, every day go unnoticed until an emergency takes place and they immediately use their training, uh, their brain and training muscle kick into gear uh, where they don't have to uh, wonder what to do. Countless hours of, of practicing, of drilling, countless hours of tabletops, countless hours of scenarios and knowing how to respond. They were ready. They were prepared. They were just waiting for the moment for Ebola to hit the soil of New York so they can implement what they already was prepared for. We have a great um, group of men and women in this city who are our first responders. And I'm happy to be here today because I was a member of them for 22 years. And there's no greater, finer mission you can have in the city of New York than to provide public safety and be a first responder. They love what they do, and we love them before, because of that. And Mayor, we thank you for allowing New Yorkers to see what our everyday first responders do every day of their lives, unnoticed, uh, undaunted, uh, just committed to protecting the people of the city of New York. Thank you very much. Before we uh, take some questions, I'd just like to ask the folks in the first row with me to turn around and applaud these yeah. individuals who are part of this important work. Let's take questions on this topic, and then we'll take some off. Go ahead, Dave. Mayor or, or, or the commissioner, um, what kind of efforts are being made to monitor these EMS workers so that we don't have a Dallas situation where there was a mistake made? I mean, I don't know if their temperature is taken every few days or what it is. And the second thing is, despite everything you've said about their bravery and the great work that they've done, weren't they a little bit afraid? <laughs> well, I, I will, let me say a couple things before I turn to the commissioner. First of all, I, I talked to some of these individuals to ask that very same question, how did it feel? And uh, what I always admire about our first responders is that the, the response is almost always something like all in a day's work. There's a certain um, calm, focused, tranquil attitude that makes them so good at what they do. I don't think every human being is meant for this level of work. I think it's a special kind of person who can do this work. And I think they're typically people who have not only an extraordinary desire to help others, but uh, incredible strength, inner strength. And so, you know, I, I would be shocked if any human being didn't have a moment of concern. But from my conversations with these guys, uh, they're pretty cool in the saddle. And it's pretty amazing to think about. Um, I just want to emphasize, you know, I give a lot of respect to folks in Dallas and the leadership of Dallas who have come out very openly and said, we wish we had done things differently. And they've been very honest about it. And they've actually reached out around the country trying to share uh, others with others the lessons they learned. And those lessons have been taken to heart. So I think the very fact that the uh, buddy system that's in place here, the ve great deal of care that's taken in every step of the process uh, speaks volumes about the fact that we believe this is a very, very secure approach to protecting the health and well-being of our first responders. The, I mentioned being on the uh, isolation floor at Bellevue the other day. Uh, the number of uh, steps taken, the number of people supervising, the checks and balances, that this is, this is supremely professional work being done by great professionals. So 
What happened in Dallas was uh, very, very sad, and they've owned up to that fact. When uh, people are in country, in the three affected countries, obviously uh, medical professionals are dealing with exceedingly difficult conditions. Um, although, thank God, the ones, the medical professionals who have come back, even those who got sick in one of the three countries, brought back here, were able to fully recover. But I think the bottom line to your question is there's a tremendous amount of care being done to monitor each and every step along the way. Well, I think that's very true. And the members are, uh, certainly trust their training, they trust their equipment. And uh, the manner in which they suit up and the manner in which they doff the, and are decontaminated protects them from exposure. That being said, uh, uh, with an excess of caution, we do monitor the members' temperatures for 21 days. But we do not believe it's an exposure. We don't treat it as an exposure. The members don't uh, take it as such. They are fully confident in, in what they do and how they do it. operation who can just describe it with life a little bit? There are people here who are involved in the operation, but as uh, Eric Adams alluded to, uh, the famous phrase, there is no I in team, uh, the attitude, and the commissioner can speak to it too, is that they, they are a team, they work as a unit, uh, they want to be thought of as a unit. Mayor, did you? Yeah, I did. Um, thanks. Mr. Mayor, you, you've mentioned in, in recent days over the past week that the city's public health system, specifically Bellevue, um, has benefited from some of the experiences that we've dealt with in the city, like the AIDS epidemic. Yes. I'm wondering if there's a parallel here, um, if there are certain scenarios, um, hazmat or otherwise, that the, the city's um, EM EMS force has trained for, especially in the wake of 9-11, that have helped us be more prepared now. Let me, uh, to the commissioner or anyone else who wants to speak to the question, I think it's a great question, what did we learn from 9-11 that's uh, uh, helping us now, but just one point on the uh, reality of Bellevue that speaks to the same thing. You know, that unit, which is playing a crucial role right this minute, as I say, the eyes of the world are on Bellevue Hospital right now. That is a unit that was developed 20 years ago in the midst of a tuberculos tuberculosis crisis connected to the AIDS crisis. It was a, a horribly complicated situation. And our public health professionals had to figure out a whole different approach to treatment because they had to both um, cure the disease in uh, the patients they were treating, but they had to protect the medical professionals at the same time. And they realized, and this is why we should be very proud as New Yorkers, they realized there was a very different approach they could take to how they laid out that floor, how they let the flow of air go in and out, how they set up different chambers so that people could be isolated uh, and checked on the way to doing each task. So that's from a crisis 20 years ago. Um, no one was thinking we'd ever see Ebola on our shores. But the work done in that time has given us the foundation for being able to handle Dr. Spencer safely and to protect our first responders in the process. And especially what, what's gone on in the world since 9-11, of course, the fire department has been training ever since and preparing itself for any possibility, any possible type of attack. So therefore, we have units that are prepared for chemical, biological agents. That type of training and that type of equipment lent itself to this type of event in which people are comfortable in operating in these types of suits and uh, were ready for any type of an emergency and Ebola coming just presented itself as an opportunity to use their training. Mayor, if, if anyone from Dallas reached out to New York City and if so, what advice would they convey? I got a very gracious call from the mayor of Dallas, Mayor Rawlings. I had actually met him back in June at the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, meeting in Dallas. Um, he's, a, I think, an extraordinary public servant, and he called and said, look, if there's anything we can do, if there's any assistance we can provide, if there's any, uh, any part of our history that would be helpful, or getting our doctors talking to your doctors, um, he, was, he was really extraordinary in being willing to help. And clearly what's happened, and I, when I was on the isolation floor at Bellevue the other day, it was quite clear doctors are talking to doctors all over the country as a normal part of perfecting the treatment. Uh, literally while I was there, they were on the phone to Nebraska and to Emory University in Atlanta talking through treatment approaches. So um, there's been a great uh, spirit in the medical community, in the uh, emergency medical services community to share what they're learning as they go along, and that has become really a national phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. The mistakes of Dallas that this city is working to not repeat. Well, look, I think what's clear, and I'll I'll speak, and I'm, the commissioner and others may want to add. 
what happened in Dallas was that there wasn't a clear protocol that every individual up and down the food chain understood, right? And, and that has been the difference here. Um, and I give credit to all the great uh, leaders of our agencies, Commissioner Nigro, to uh, Commissioner Bratton, uh, Commissioner Bassett, Dr. Raju, all of them have been working together for weeks and weeks, perfecting the protocols and the messages that had to be clearly articulated to each and every member of their agencies. And that's why it worked. Everyone knew what their role was and everyone knew uh, to communicate with their supervisors and get information to uh, up the chain of command so that it could be acted on quickly. So I think uh, there's been nothing ad hoc about the New York City response. Everything is meticulously planned and drilled and there's constant communication. I've been very struck, you know, we, we had a series of meetings where we were doing planning with a whole host of agencies, and everyone has continued talking to each other, trying to make sure that each other had what they needed. It's been very powerful. The other day, when, um, you know, we've obviously had a number of different situations where we had to work with community folks, and um, in light of the situation at Dr. Spencer's building, or even uh, last night with this five-year-old child, to see the way that um, EMS and FDNY have played a role, NYPD has played a very active role working with community residents. As I said, health departments have people on the scene, and the whole goal has been to support each other in the effort. Um, when we brought uh, Dr. Uh, Spencer's fiance back to the apartment, the just seamless coordination between all the agencies, um, I think everyone knows that the other agencies have their back. And that's something that clearly wasn't uh, as obvious in other places. That's become a clear tradition here in New York City. Yes. Mr. Chair, can you please give us an update on how Dr. Spencer is doing? And also, what's your latest sentiment on the whole quarantine issue? So on Dr. Spencer, uh, condition remains uh, serious but stable, um, emphasizing that we've said for a few days that you know this is the tough part of the trajectory, uh, that things will get worse before they get better. Um, so he's got some tough days ahead. But uh, I mentioned my conversation with him um, a few days ago. I mean, he's got an extraordinary spirit. Um, everyone I've talked to who've been part of his direct treatment says he's a fighter. He um, you know, is keeping his, his sense of humor despite everything he's dealing with. And he's getting the best care in the world. But it will be a challenging next few days. Yeah. Can you uh, describe exactly from the EMT's perspective what happens when the 911 call comes in and it's a possible lethal location? What exactly is happening? What are they doing first? Do they gear up after they arrive in the scene? Or they, how does it all happen? Sure. It comes in, uh, we call fever transport case, a suspected case of Ebola. It goes to a specific group of units in the city, Haztec ambulances. They suit up on the scene and their equipment protects them entirely from contact with the patient from head to toe. That patient is transported. They're met at the hospital by another team from the fire department of de decontamination specialists who assist them in taking the gear off when that time comes so that no breach occurs. And uh, that's pretty much the, in a nutshell, from start to finish. Um, I think the fact is, you know, the CDC put out some additional uh, standards yesterday. We're working with them. Uh, we're working with our state government and our state health department. Um, we know this is, uh, as I said, this is a, a fast evolving situation and every level of government is keeping up with the situation and making decisions accordingly. Um, we uh, believe fundamentally that the approach we're taking is working here in the city and we'll continue to do that. But we, by definition, I said very clearly, there's a, a hierarchy here that's very important to respect in a time of crisis. State government, federal government, we're working with everyone in constant uh, communication with everyone. Um, we've got uh, 
folks, the three folks obviously who were in direct contact with uh, Dr. Spencer, his fiance and two friends uh, in quarantine. They're checked twice a day. Uh, I get reports as they are checked. Uh, all of them have continued to have uh, absolutely good health, no fever, no symptoms. So that's very good news. We are now have begun as of yesterday additionally uh, monitoring uh, individuals who have come back from the affected countries but have shown no symptoms. In other words, upon arrival, they did not have symptoms. They did not have a history of being around uh, anyone with the disease. But per CDC uh, guidelines, we're doing the extra the thing. We're going the extra mile and reaching out to them. Uh, as we have continued that outreach, no one has shown any symptoms or had uh, anything that was concerning. So that will continue in, for each individual until they get to the 21-day mark. What about the medical? Louder, please. If you could talk about the capacity of the city to handle a number of cases. Sure. If you were to get like eight or ten people who had suspected of COVID at once, maybe the commissioner. I'll speak about the overview, and then the commissioner can certainly speak about, in particular, the capacity of HAZTAC and HAZMAT, which is very substantial. Um, we now have five facilities determined by the state uh, to be particularly able to handle an Ebola case. Uh, Bellevue being uh, the first among them. Uh, those facilities have adequate capacity. Uh, we, I'm thrilled to say, you know, we have news today that the one uh, additional suspected case is not a case of Ebola. It's a different respiratory disease, thank God, but again, that child needs treatment for that disease and he will get that treatment at Bellevue. But uh, to date, we have the one case. Uh, we have capacity at all five hospitals. So we're prepared on that front. Let me have the commissioner speak about uh, has TAC and HAZMAT. Well, I, I would hesitate to say unlimited, but uh, we have 36 HAZTAC and rescue ambulances in the city of New York. We have four engine companies that are prepared to do decon along with the uh, squad companies and rescue companies. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see, and these people can, once they're deconned, can go back into service and transport another patient. So we're, we're certainly not concerned with being uh, overloaded at this time with the possibility of too many folks to transport. To go back to the quarantine question again, uh, Commissioner Bassett has said that given the way the state's policy was unveiled, that there were about two to three passengers who would come through JFK a day that might meet the quarantine criteria. Um, so far, the Department of Health has said there's no one else who is being quarantined. Um, is the city following the state's quarantine? Well, absolutely. We're working very closely with the city. Let, let's be clear. The quarantine criteria mean you're meeting one of two scenarios. You're either a medical professional who worked directly with people afflicted with Ebola, or you are an average citizen who was in one of the three countries and in contact with someone directly affected by Ebola. Uh, since the announcement of those standards, to the best of my understanding, no mm -hmm. one has arrived who met those qualifications. But because of the CDC guidelines, even if someone arrived who did not meet those qualifications, simply had been in one of those three countries, we will continue to monitor them, but that does not require quarantine. Mr. Mayor, how many medical professionals are being monitored and so, you know, having their temperature taken twice a day, and the doctors at Bellevue and the EMTs, how many medical I, I can't give you the exact number. Certainly our colleagues at Department of Health and at HHC can tell you how uh, the Bellevue scenario is being handled. But I can tell you from my own experience, as I said, I went on the isolation floor, came off, and then they said, here's your thermometer. I mean, that's, it's pretty common for health professionals to know that that is something to do constantly, and it's not a burden for them. It's part of their work. Sally? Yeah, there's four beds at uh, Bellevue, and then the other facilities are uh, Montefiore, um, uh, Sinai, uh, Columbia Presbyterian, and uh, Long Island Jewish. Mr. Mayor, there, were, there are many African citizens being stigmatized because of what is happening right now. Two young boys were brutally beaten Friday, and the, the African community hasn't seen you around and some people are wondering when you will be coming to reassure them. We've obviously been focused on 
the core of our response. That's been job one to make sure that everything we have to do to serve people is in place. Um, and I'm, I will say before uh, Thursday, uh, Dr. Bassett had spent substantial time reaching out to members of the African immigrant community, as had a number of other officials of my administration. Um, it, what happened to those two young men is unconscionable and unacceptable. We've made very clear. Uh, we won't tolerate any bullying, any stereotyping, any stigmatizing. Uh, the school involved uh, stepped in very aggressively uh, and I think has sent a clear message to that school community that this will not be accepted. So uh, I mentioned separately a few days ago that some nurses um, from Bellevue had also suffered discrimination because they were affiliated with Bellevue. I couldn't think of anything uh, more unfair than treating folks who are doing heroic work on our behalf uh, with a, a sense of discrimination. So the message all over the city is the situation is under control. This is a very difficult disease to contract again, only through direct contact with the bodily fluids of an individual who has the disease, not airborne, not casual contact. People have to pay attention to those facts, show absolute respect for all New Yorkers, show respect for members of the African immigrant community in our city, and I certainly will continue to get that message across, and I look forward to meeting with members of the community as well. Rich. Mr. Mayor, um, Governor Christie was asked yesterday whether he would apologize to the nurse who was held in Newark, and I'm just wondering... Phil, hold on. Phil, you want off? Phil, you want off? Yeah. Just, we're just have a time issue. I'm checking on Go ahead. Right. Uh, Governor Christie was asked yesterday whether, whether he would apologize to the nurse who was held, the asymptomatic nurse, who is now in Maine, and he refused to apologize. You think, I, I think you've criticized what, what happened over there. Do you think he owes her an apology? You know, again, this is a moment where it's not about personalities. This is something a little more serious than uh, everyday uh, current events. You know, this is a crisis. And so what I want to say is that uh, Nurse Hickox is a hero. Um, she went and did something that few people would do to try and protect others and to protect this country. Uh, we're going to need a lot more medical professionals like her uh, to go and serve, just like our military is going to go and serve. So she did not deserve what happened to her. It was absolutely unfair and inappropriate. She was treated disrespectfully, and she was not even given the dignity of uh, being informed of the circumstance and why she was being treated that way. So to me, uh, I think it is not about uh, looking back. It's about, one, truly honoring the people who do that work and supporting them, recruiting a lot more people to do that work, uh, and providing support in that process, um, and recognizing that Anyone who has served upon arrival should be treated as a returning hero. Thanks, everyone.